Welcome to the Practical Enneagram. Ingrid Stab brings together the fields of career, coaching and guidance with the Enneagram. She's singular in the field for doing that. Ingrid has co-written a book with leading expert and cartoonist Elizabeth Wagley called The Career Within You, which is the only career-related Enneagram book on the market, I believe. What I appreciate most about Ingrid and her work is the hard line she takes around how we use the Enneagram to support us in our careers. She says that there's really only one one unique thing that each type does uniquely well or one type advantage sort of burns her bridges with how other Enneagram theory can weigh in on our strengths. I also love how she's all about getting her clients and those she advises to be aware of their strengths. I've actually altered the way that I work with my clients since this interview. As I debrief the person's Enneagram type, I'm taking more time in explaining the type's essential qualities and their strengths and asking people to feed back to me on how they experience their strength and where and how they get to use it. She also presents me to the fact that the thing I enjoy most about making this podcast is this bit at the beginning where I get to comment on what I find unique about the expert. It's amazing how we miss these things. Ingrid asked me to mention that the other teacher that she didn't refer to in the beginning of this episode is Rene Rosario, who is core faculty at the Narrative Enneagram. Ingrid runs mastermind groups, so if you're interested, definitely visit her website, strengthsinnumbers.com. I hope that you enjoy. briefly how the Enneagram found you? I have been studying the Enneagram since the early 90s. So it's been a long time. A lot of people that you've sp- spoken to on your podcast, we've, mm-hmm. we've we fell in love decades ago and it's just a lifelong commitment. During that time, coincidentally, I also, when I was a young adult, um, I also like books career type books. Like one of them is called Do What You Are, which is um, based on the Myers-Briggs and very helpful for especially young people. And so this was back in the 90s. And then also uh, everybody seems to know the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? In my 20s, I was also very concerned about career and what did I want to do with my life? The Enneagram was almost a separate pursuit, you know, completely fell in love with it. Read all the um, authors at the time, of course, like Rizzo Hudson and uh, Helen Palmer. I did eventually end up studying with Helen Palmer and David Daniels. Mm -hmm. I got certified in the narrative tradition, um, started around, I'd say maybe 2000. So in the early 2000s, I became a narrative tradition teacher. So my big influencers are, of course, Mm -hmm. Helen Palmer, David Daniels, and two of their master trainers, which are Peter O'Hanrahan. And another one of their fabulous trainers, I'll mention her later, but I want to make sure I mention Elizabeth Wagley, an author. She wrote um, The Enneagram Made Easy and a number of books. She came out with her first book in the early 90s. And I just absolutely loved her books because Mm -hmm. they make the Enneagram so accessible to the average person who could benefit from the Enneagram, but they're not necessarily going to become deep enthusiasts like you and me, but they can still benefit. And so she makes it so accessible Mm. and she's also a cartoonist. So Mm. she brings so much humor. It sounds like you're not familiar with Elizabeth Wigley. I am, but only via you, because I know you co-wrote the book with her, your book. Um, Yes. Yeah. But I hadn't heard of her prior to going through you, actually. Her first book was in the early 90s called mm. The Enneagram Made Easy. She's probably one of the num- you know top best-selling authors. She's translated in I don't know how many different languages, like 17 different languages. So many of us absolutely love her work because it touches us in a special way that's mm. like with humor and pictures worth a thousand words. And so there's so much you can express immediately. Mm. People may not understand the Enneagram, but they'll see a cartoon of some typical situation with a four or with a seven. And, and it's like, yes, that's my brother. Or that's my mother. So, um, so she and I teamed up because we also both have a heart for making the Enneagram accessible, you know, to the, to the general public, even though, you know, I love to go deep with it. And it's certainly a spiritual framework, a framework for spiritual growth. And yet we don't have to scare people away with the depth of it right away. You yeah, know? totally. And Elizabeth passed away a few oh. years ago. And mm-hmm. so I'm, 
crush. She became one of my best friends. And oh. so for a couple of years, I even didn't really do much with the Enneagram, just grieving Elizabeth. But um, she started, most of her stuff was in the early 90s. One of her last books is the Enneagram of Death. I will definitely read that. What type was Elizabeth? Well, that's the funny thing. I The official answer is she is a type five. Working closely with her, I have a sense of it that she was another type. But oh, really? I, I just want to honor her memory. If she says she's a five, she's yeah. a five. Maybe she was a five. She had mm. incredible focus. You know, I, I'm a seven. So, mm. you know, when we'd work on the manuscript together for the book, The Career Within You, I would work for two hours and then I'd be like bouncing off the walls and she could sit there and work on the manuscript, you know, for 12, 13 hours straight, no problem. So I, that was probably a source of frustration for her to <laughs> co-author with a seven. Helpful, no doubt as well with uh, seven capacities. How did the Enneagram become central to your work? in supporting people in identifying their strengths and suitable applications of them in their careers? You know, I had these two parallel parts of my life. One was career and business. I'm a, I have an MBA from Yale and I'm a marketer mm. and all that. The more I really got to know the Enneagram, it just became obvious that there, first off, there was a need for a book with career applications based on the Enneagram since it's mm. so incredibly powerful. And in the intro, you were mentioning millennials, but you're mm. right. It turns out that this is some of the things that we discovered are absolutely critical for people even midlife. Yeah. And it's, it's shocking for people who know the Enneagram so well, have studied it for years or certified teachers. And we all somehow don't tend to fully understand our greatest strengths and mm-hmm. our impact on people as described by our Enneagram types. And so it's heartbreaking for me to interview people, you know, mm-hmm. in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and like these missed opportunities because mm-hmm. they didn't fully embrace them themselves, mm-hmm. you know, and their Enneagram type. We all do that. I continue to do that even now. It is heartbreaking. I agree with you. It's, it's so rare to encounter individuals who have a good understanding of what their strengths are, what their unique gifts are. And part of it, I think, is that we tend to take things for granted, like what we've been doing since we were small children, essentially honing certain Um, strengths that we have that we develop them because of our, you know, our attention based on our type. We are so good at certain things that we take them for granted. We either expect other people to have those same strengths. We get frustrated when they don't, and we don't realize the full impact that sometimes when we're talking about our resume and the things that we do at a company, we're, we're all just parroting the same thing that everybody says, what we think people are looking for in our roles. And in fact, the, the most amazing thing that we're doing is actually has to do with the strengths of our Enneagram type, and we don't even see it. Yep. So you've written a book with Elizabeth Wade. The Career Within You, How to Find the Perfect Job for Your Personality. Who is this book for, Ingrid, and what does it help people to do? So I think when we were first writing the book, we imagined this is for younger people starting out in their careers, and it could maybe be a gateway book for them to start studying, reading other Enneagram authors. The book came out in 2010. So in the last 11 years or so, I've actually had a lot of mid-career people that have gravitated (laughs) towards the work. And I now um, run mastermind groups for Mm -hmm. mid-career leaders working on everyday issues and long-term planning for our careers. So it's really for, it's not for retirees, although Mm -hmm. it's a useful tool if people are coaches, if they have a second career as a coach. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool in their tool chest to you know, work with anyone who's still actively engaged in their primary career. So it's really for anyone looking to explore any sort of career choice or career change or in a re-exploration about what to do with their work. Everything involved with careers. So like you said, looking for a career, a career change, or thirdly, collaboration and working with others at work. So understanding the impact that we have and then the impact, the greatest impact others can have, it allows us to make the most of other strengths at work mm-hmm. and also how to work with our, you know, our blind spots and diminish some of the negatives of yeah. our habits to be better collaborators at work. Right, right. So what specific aspects of the Enneagram are useful in identifying our personality strengths and what and the sorts of work that we will find satisfying. 
Yes. And um, with that question, I know you had sent me a, a longer version of that question. The, this is what I really like to highlight for people who study the Enneagram is I don't know if people talk about it that much, mm-hmm. but it's it's truly what is the key strength, key career strength of each type. That's the most important thing. All this, mm-hmm. all that other stuff is great, you know, mm-hmm. and, but it, people should not miss what is their greatest strength based on their Enneagram type. So for me as a type seven, it's exploring possibilities for a type four, it's expressing individuality. Mm-hmm. And so there's something very special about expressing individuality that the, the four brings not only for themselves, but to allow others like, you know, for you as a coach. You're probably helping bring out the authenticity for folks that you're working with in a way that someone with other types cannot do. It's like, it's like your superpower. A coach like me, if I was a a seven coach, I could help a coaching client explore possibilities Mm -hmm. in ways that might blow you away that, wow, like, you know, beyond what you might do as a four. The simplicity of that has really just hit me actually, Ingrid. There's a lot to look at with the Enneagram that you're saying or don't be unaware of this central thing that you're doing. And then can you go through the other types? Yes. Okay. So for the type one, it's making improvements. The type two, meeting needs. Type three, achieving a successful image. Type five, acquiring knowledge. Type six, mitigating risk. Type eight, asserting clear boundaries. Ooh. Yes. And type nine, maintaining harmony. Mm. Or actually, Liz and I like to say inner calm, because with the nine, you're not necessarily going to be a mediator running around maintaining harmony with other people. It might just be inner calm within yourself. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I kind of don't want to complicate it by asking you about the other stuff, but you must get this query from people. Well, how does my subtype influence the work that I find satisfying or the work that I should do and yeah what do you do with those sort of queries and questions I mean we all have all three instincts even if we emphasize one more than the other Um, for example okay I'm a type seven and I'm very entrepreneurial like one-on-one ones are the most classic entrepreneur you know as you know one-on-one types love intensity the more intensity the more juice the better so you know, they're going to love the wild ride that entrepreneurs tend to experience with the ups and downs of Mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. But I'm a self-pressed seven and I can be an entrepreneur too. Like I'm never going to say like, oh, you're not going to do as well in entrepreneurship because you're a Mm -hmm. self-pressed seven. Sorry. It's going to be too much of a wild ride for you. Mm -hmm. No, that's okay. You know, a a self-pressed seven might have need a little bit more steadiness, a little bit more predictability, Mm -hmm. might approach the business differently. But so that's one example. There's certain kind of misnomers that basically anyone can do any job. So it's just, it's helpful to understand now what strengths are you going to bring to that job given your type or your subtype, you know? So as an entrepreneur, I'll bring more maybe stability and carefulness as a self-pres and maybe that sub, you know, one on one seven will be more risk-taking, you know, that's great, but it doesn't mean that therefore this type must be a certain, that same thing applies for the um, nine types. So it's not like Type sixes should be lawyers and engineers or whatever, but they are very good at reducing risk. So no matter what job they do, they're going to bring some element of reducing risk to that role. I have more to say about this, but let me just pause for a moment to see if I love it because it's not about narrowing options and finding certain jobs that suit us it's about bringing our essential gift to the work that we're doing absolutely and since so many people miss that I feel like Mm -hmm. keep re you know keep reinforcing this idea so that people can be in their own magnificence yeah you know with the my are you familiar with Myers-Briggs yeah okay so there's like T and F T is the thinking F is the feeling so you could associate career strengths with that Mm -hmm. um you know, logic versus being tuned into people or Mm -hmm. feelings. When you apply that to the Enneagram and careers, every type, all nine types have thinking skills, Mm -hmm. all nine types have feeling skills. So it's not whether we have those strengths is how do we do it unique to the strengths of our Enneagram type? For example, um, the type one, if, if someone is very strong in feeling for type one, but they're one, it comes out in conscientiousness and courteousness. Um, it's this really 
beautiful sensitivity to people, but showing this courteousness, whereas feeling for the type two has to do with expressiveness. And then for the type three is reading people, being able to read people and then alter their image to fit what people need, you know, from the audience or, and uh, we could do this, we could go all around then just to jump to the thinking feelings, I mean, I'm sorry, the thinking skills. So for example, for the six, Mm -hmm. it's problem solving. For the seven, it's multivariate thinking. For the eight, it's clarifying. I love how eights, like Peter O'Hanrahan is an eight. And Mm -hmm. so the way he teaches the Enneagram, he really helps clarify distinct boundaries between concepts and make sure people clearly understand the difference Mm -hmm. between types and so forth. And then for the nine, it's um, sort of like a broad perspective, a certain um, thinking where you take in all the information and then synthesizing the information. So Mm -hmm. These, this is all the same skill. So if anyone was on a job interview being interviewed for this skill, they would say kind of the same answers, but it has this special flavor to it that I want people to understand and bring out more in, in their work and so forth. The way that you've brought the cognitive functions together with the Enneagram there is so interesting. Is that in the book? So what we have in the book is for each type, um, people can rate themselves on the five key strengths of the type. Because what we've done is we've done hundreds of interviews and we've, Liz Wagley and I identified what we found to be the consistent five top three strengths of each type. Mm-hmm. Not all people of that type have all five. It, that would be odd if you had all five. So you're going to have two of those five will be your top two strengths. So as a, as a therapist, you know, maybe you would be stronger in compassion where you know, a scientist might be stronger in a certain type of discernment that also mm-hmm. could be for. But anyway, so what I was saying about the book is that there's a questionnaire where you rate yourself on mm-hmm. these five strengths from one to five, and you give extra credit for the strength that you most enjoy using. So if you're good at it, mm-hmm. but you don't enjoy that one as much, maybe you give it a four. If you're good <laughs> at it and you love it, you give it a five. So in those five strengths, you will notice one of them is a feeling and one of them is a thinking kind of a skill. So you'll, now that I'm telling you the Myers-Briggs is baked in there, you'll you'll notice. That's really cool. And would you say each type has a form of extroversion and introversion as well? And we try to back off from that. We try Mm. not to do that. And we also try to get away from the sensing and um, intuitive versus, and this is like a pet peeve of mine. Actually, I learned this from Liz. And so now we see it was like, oh, we just want to scream because in the Enneagram community, Mm. we all tend to have a bias towards the end, the intuitive thinking. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so a lot of us missed the sensate version of the type. Yes. Even a lot of the Enneagram books, you know, that, that of like the great Enneagram authors are talking about type, but it's like, it's, it can be strongly swayed towards the intuitive version, or there might be a judgment where they think a certain type is sensate. And so they describe the sensate version of that because the <laughs> author doesn't like that type of, if they're an intuitive, it becomes more obvious with, um, with career, because if you're a type four and you're a sensate or, you know, maybe your art might be you might be more of an artisan Mm -hmm. you know maybe you're a carpenter or as opposed to a therapist you're still expressing individuality but in a very sensate way so it's easier to see when you talk to people about career I think along that note I think maybe you could probably already intuit why it's best to stay away from introversion and extroversion I mean you could go there if you want to write a whole book on it but you know the extroverted nine and the introverted nine are so different Mm -hmm. you know and so these kind of things can get us distracted and off on the wrong topic like we're talking about is what is the core type you know at their core whether you're an extrovert or introvert what's going on internally for the nine that's what we try to keep people Mm -hmm. focused on i want to ask about what have been the biggest learnings and lessons from your experience using the enneagram to support people in navigating career choices that question is such a good question that maybe one day i should write a book just Mm -hmm. on that topic because by interviewing hundreds of people around their career my heart breaks to notice certain patterns that happen over and over for certain types. And I would like to tell people sooner, like, be aware of this so you can Mm -hmm. avoid this happening to you. So for example, for the type one, ones have such a strong sense of responsibility and will often show such duty to the organization or the infrastructure, the powers that be, that they will go decades not pursuing like their true passion or what would give Mm -hmm. them joy. 
because they're being so responsible and such good citizens. And so I, I interview people that are in their retirement and they never went for it and did what they really wanted to do. It, it almost, to me, it feels like it was a waste. Like, wow, you had that great career and you never did what you were probably meant to do. The obvious one is of course, like type threes, any type three, if they find the Enneagram will hopefully learn this. But the people who don't understand what their greatest strength is as a three, you know, will just run themselves into the ground as workaholics, never realize that they're loved just as they are. They are enough. They do enough. You know, I mean, that can often end in tragedy, right? Like heart attacks, serious health problems that can be very painful. But um, there's certain patterns I see for each of the nine types in terms of career that it's like, wow, I wish I could run and warn people in their twenties and thirties, like keep reminding them each decade so that they don't blow it. So they're retired and they never learned the lesson that they need to learn in mm-hmm. terms of fulfilling, like I said, their magnificence in their own career and their sense of fulfillment in their life. I don't want to put you on the spot here. Do you think you can run through all the type? You know, well, like I said, this would, should probably be my next book. I actually haven't written this down. These are just mm. my observations. So I don't know if I can. I don't know if I have them ready for all the nine, but why don't I do the ones that come to mind? Yeah, that would be so great. Why don't you throw a number at me? What about a six, Ingrid? Okay, well, okay, for the type six, and they're great at mitigating risk, and Mm. of course they want certainty. But the thing with the type sixes is that a lot of sixes have a lot of vacillation back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, because, um, you know, they're seeking certainty. So they're afraid to take a step. You know, they take a step to the right, then they second guess it. Then they take a step to the left and they second guess it back and forth. So there's just a lot of energy burned. You know, this is where a spiritual practice helps even, you know, with career stuff so that if a type six can learn this about themselves, they can, they will be able to make some strong choices in their career that are scary. And um, they have to dig deep to like a deeper part of themselves to find a courage to prevent that vacillation that can often undermine themselves in their career. I think the suffering that we generate up for ourselves in our careers can awaken a spiritual practice or inclination, just, just like in that example have you found that with people? Yes, I think so. I mean, even for myself as a seven, Mm -hmm. you know, the spiritual path for the seven is sobriety. And I think with me running around chasing after shiny objects in my career, I had so many cool jobs and so Mm -hmm. many adventures, you know, but then to still have that sense of satisfaction in my career, eventually it, it requires me to surrender to a spiritual practice the fruits of that are shown then again in, in terms of like my focus and successes and work. But until I do that, I'm, as a seven, I'm just going to keep going round and around. I could give other examples, but I thought yeah. I would share my own. So I will, I will ask maybe for one more type, an example of the sort of patterns that you've noticed, and then we can maybe move on. But type nine? Well, let me, let me first ask you, do you end up with a lot of nine clients? Okay. I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, type nines can keep career coaches in business for a long time. You know, type nines can move very slowly in their career, which is fine. Actually, my husband is a nine and there can be great wisdom to moving slowly instead of jumping right into something, but it can take a long time for a nine to figure out what they really want to do with their lives. Mm. They can easily just go along with this or that. And um, the exciting thing is when the nines can tap into their anger and get really pissed off and have Mm -hmm. a sense of injustice they can finally see and just go for it and go for the thing that they want. So I do know some people in their fifties, I see them doing it now. And it's like, Oh, I wish you did that in your thirties. But in the meantime, nines have a lot of self-discovery to do and does not hurt to work with a career coach. I mean, you may end up having more nines that you work with and that's okay because they're so externally focused on the external distractions to be able to hear that quiet voice inside. I think it's good for coaches to be patient because it could be a long, long process. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because there's something, there might be something beautiful that's stewing and cooking and it requires years until that dish, you know, or until that stew is ready. Someone like me, a type seven, I get it. You know, I want to push, push, push. Come on, just go out there and do the interview now, you know, but maybe they need another six years until they come to that point. But it's okay because in that time, it may not be apparent what important work they're doing, but they are doing important work. And then finally, years mm-hmm. later, that moment will come when their fire is in their belly and they're ready to go for it. 
how does using the Enneagram compare with something like Strengths or Success Finder, which are the other like big models that people use to try to figure out what their career strengths are? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. So what we offer as Enneagram teachers is just as good, if not better than Strengths Finder, because we can pinpoint people's strengths just like Strengths Finder can. What we as Enneagram teachers have that the Strengths Finder coaches don't have is that we have this beautiful organic system that shows us how we all fit together in humanity, how the nine types, how we all work together and how we need each other. So basically this helps people, you know, crack the code for collaboration that Mm -hmm. strengths finder could never do. So with the Enneagram, we can help people find their strengths and then find out how they can better collaborate with others at work. And it's Mm -hmm. all baked right in there in, in the wisdom of of the Enneagram. I've never done Strengths Finder or Success Finder, but so they're enlightening for the individual, but they don't sort of um, clue us into how the individual sort of collaborates in the team. Is that correct? That's right. And the thing is that um, our framework that we use came from a mindfulness tradition, right? Mm. A wisdom tradition. And so it's it's almost like an organic, complete model. Whereas Mm. Strengths Finder, it comes from good data, you know, Corporations like the fact that StrengthsFinder has deep data. Talk to people like over 100,000 organizations, and so they have a lot of data. But if you look at the StrengthsFinder book from the lens of the Enneagram, it's sort of mix or match random kind of skills. You know, it's like, yes, there's skills, but there's no order to it, really. Mm-hmm. So it, it's sort of random. However, this original list of skills came together, mm-hmm. and then they backed it up with data. But it's not a complete system like the Enneagram. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, we don't have the depth of research yet in the Enneagram, but one day we will. We're we're getting there. Can you walk me through how you use the Enneagram when a client comes in with work or livelihood related challenges, as often happens in the coaching and therapeutic space? Yes, nobody likes to be pigeonholed. And so what I do is um, I present three possible types Mm -hmm. and I let them try on a type. And so, um, for example, this one lady, one of her possible types was the two because she took a quiz, you know, so it said she was a two in the quiz. Do you have them do a quiz or assessment? I do. I do have a quiz. I have a website called Mm -hmm. strengthsinnumbers.com. You know, you and I know that someone can only determine their type really through their own internal process. Mm. You know, we really shouldn't be typing people and yet people want quizzes. So, okay, fine, we'll give you a quiz. I actually call it a strengths diagnostic. And then I present three types to them. And typically one of them is their type. One of them, it's often like a wing or something. And then one of them is often a lookalike type. So they're actually a one, but they typed strong on a six or something. And like, no, you're not, you're not a one and a six, you're a one, but let them discover that. Mm-hmm. So we go through a gentle process where they try on the type. And then, and then actually we do that quiz I told you about where they rate themselves in their top five strengths. Mm-hmm. And that's helpful. If you're ever having trouble typing somebody, do the strengths test on them because that'll help you pinpoint it times when other other methods aren't working. And then um, we really help people take the long view, like really like look at least 10 years out and not uh, restrain themselves with their current situation. You know, what would give them the greatest joy and sense of fulfillment in their life if they could have this thing and then start doing some like practical planning to how to get there. And it might involve a lot, you know, massive change that they're not ready for right now, but over time, you know, as you work with them, they'll they'll Mm -hmm. ease their way towards some big changes in their lives. So initially it's them finding the type within them. So is there some time spent connecting what they learn about their type with their current career challenges? I really try to emphasize strengths. We know that the Enneagram helps us very quickly see what all our weaknesses are. (laughs) I try to gently guide people away from that because their Mm -hmm. weaknesses, it's, they're going to come up, like eventually we'll work with them, but oddly people don't fully embrace their strengths for some reason. I don't Mm -hmm. know what that, why that is. And so oftentimes people are in jobs where they're just not even using their greatest strengths at all, or they're hiding them or keeping them secret. Or (laughs) One guy who was a project manager, this guy's actually a seven. He's very good at the social networking that a seven does, but it was like, he would hide that to try to look like a six project manager or something. Well, finally, over time, we got him into another department in his corporation where he has to be, um, the technology that he's focused on now requires him to connect with many other departments. 
So he's now able to use that strength, but the crazy thing, he wasn't even using that. So I'd rather have people just spend more time and going deeper with their strength because typically they're not using it much in their current job. Help them lean in more to that. You know, maybe later you can work on their weaknesses. I don't know if this is a bit of a simplistic question, but is there a deal breaker for each type in their careers? Your question is excellent. We're a deal break for each type. So the funny thing is, is that we're all our own worst enemy. I can believe it. Yes. (laughs) So there's no job that a certain type cannot do, you know, like let's say a teacher or a doctor, you could have a five teacher, you could have a two teacher, you could have an eight teacher, you know? So it's not that there's some job that we shouldn't do based on our type, but we will make ourselves miserable (laughs) based on our type. So for example, time and time again, the five, they will burn themselves out because they'll come in, they'll see a smarter way of doing things. They'll go hardcore on their competence as a five. They'll take over more than they should be taking over. They'll make sense of the chaos and they'll do their beautiful fiveness. And next thing you know, they're just running the whole thing and completely burning themselves out. They just took on too much Then they quit their job. (laughs) They like relax for a long time. And then they start the process again. And this is like completely unnecessary. There's that same kind of pattern with each type. Yeah. So there's a way in which we tend to make ourselves miserable as a, in each type. Can we have maybe one more example? Let's do eight. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, the eight is um, going to get into a lot of conflict, and make enemies at the corporation or wherever they're working. Just they can't help it because they're being truthful and they're being upfront. But most people can't deal with conflict and are afraid of them. So, so that's okay. I, I will say, as an aside, though, that one kind of coach works with a lot of nines. Executive coaches work a lot with eights, where they've been hired by someone at the company to deal with this eight. That's a Coach is going to make a lot of money working with eights, but, um, well, I have a special message for eights who are women. Eights make tremendous business owners. A lot of eights have what it takes to be their own boss and to run their own business. But a lot of eight women are afraid to do that for some reason, you know, like they might still be risk averse. And so if you're working with any eight women who are afraid to make that jump, you know, the, a mistake they could make to their own misery is to keep being in some weird situation where they don't respect some, you know, some man who's in charge and she's fully capable herself, but somehow she's kowtowing to this guy for like you know, gender reasons or something is yeah. like, no, just go out. It doesn't have to be a man. This is an example, but just go for it. Go out and start your business. Like you're, you're probably going to be very successful in what you do and don't be afraid and, and get support from people who love you. You know, eights are vulnerable too, like the rest of us, you know, so the few people in their life where they can be vulnerable with, they can be that little child and who will like bolster them when things get scary, you know, as they're doing their own business. So that, that's one thing I would. That's great. That's one of the personalities where the women version is a little bit oppressed by culture isn't it yes yes and today in our our world it's still hard you know if there's some gender how has doing seven been an asset to you in this work and how has it been a limitation oh that's so funny because I just want to go straight to the limitation (laughs) maybe I'll do the limitations first and then I'll try to do a little self-affirmation okay so like most sevens I can get very scattered. So I always need to remind myself to focus like my friends who are fives who have incredible focus. So I also have, you know, like sobriety. I I have the gluttony. I just want more, more, more in everything, Mm -hmm. you know, more excitement, more friends, more food, more wine, more this, more that. And so that can eventually make me ineffective if I'm just, because that's not sustainable, you know? So, and I do, I do practice a 12 step program called Mm. food addicts and recovery. And it allows me to learn what's enough on my plate and Mm. this is enough. Mm. And I can be satisfied and be okay because it's driven really there's fear like what if there's not enough what is not enough and so then that can apply not only to food but to anything you know it can apply to money to work to projects to friends to all that so um so those are a couple things personal things about my weaknesses and then um in terms of strengths I have to remind myself, I have to take myself back to the book, The Career Within You, mm-hmm. and remind myself that my greatest strengths are social networking mm-hmm. and multivariate thinking, bringing two things together, you know, like career and Enneagram or, mm-hmm. you know, doing like mashups of things because mm-hmm. I take that for granted and, mm-hmm. and do more. I mean, I do do networking well, but do it even more. Yeah. 
This has been lovely. It's a lot more of an expansive perspective than I guess I was expecting. And I don't know why. Um, I am so happy to hear that. I hope that in this conversation, um, through my strength as a seven, which is exploring possibilities, that I've opened your mind, explore the possibilities of the Enneagram, even beyond what you already <laughs> Well, you have. The next guest is Dr. Drew Moser, who has written a beautiful book on discernment, the Enneagram and discernment. Don't forget to subscribe and rate the podcast.